Welcome to another set episode of Natural Bliss Podcast. I'm your host, Joyce Wheeler. And you're going to want to go over to MajesticTara.com and get your copy of the free checklist for a better quality of life holistically. And then go over to my sister site, HeavenlyBodiesWellness.com and get your combo for the summer with the soothing salve and the soothing cleanse. It's great for your first aid kit. Two sizes of the salve are available. One is the half ounce size, which is great for putting in purses, diaper bags, even tackle bottles tackle boxes so you're going to want to go over there and get that before the summer's out for all your scrapes and bruises and bug bites and all that stuff that we deal with in the summer so today i have with me fred ruttman he currently lives in toronto he was a marketer consultant then went into academia as a college professor professor mba marketing and finance for a number of years after acquiring his MBA, his weight really ballooned up to 340 pounds. The combination of his weight issues and playing years of hockey, rugby, and football left him in perpetual pain. Every joint in his body ached. He did, did all the CICO methods, tried a bariatric doctor, and exercised his butt off, eventually getting down to about, about 280 where he plateaued until summer of 2009 came crashing down on him and forced him into permanent medical leave. In 2018, he learned about intermediate fasting and his life hasn't been the same since. He attributes the large majority of his recovery to the healing powers of intermediate fasting. So the last 12 years has been Fred fighting to get his life back. Additionally, he is writing his memoir, The Summer I Died 20 Times, along with the sequel, Dead Again, The Summer I Died 20 Times Continues. Yes, this adventure adventure never ends. Fred, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. So you experienced some health issues. You, do you want to talk about those? So you said you ended up with type 2 diabetes? Yeah, it was, when I got hit in 2009, I got hit hard. So what happened is I, the doctor thought I was randomly passing out. And every time I would pass out, I would hit my head. So I'd get a concussion. Oh, and it took the doctors a good three to four months to figure out what was happening to me. And what was actually happening to me was my heart was stopping. So I have a condition that's called a severe heart block which means the electrical system in my heart stops working. So it stops sending the signals that tell your atria and ventricle to pump the blood. So if your heart doesn't pump and you have no blood pressure, you have no blood or oxygen in your brain and you collapse. And wow. it just happened that most of the times this happened to me that we know of, I collapsed and hit my head really violently on you know, curbs and manhole covers and uh, concrete sinks and all sorts of stuff. Jeez. So it wasn't pleasant. No, it doesn't sound like that, especially considering that you never know when it's going to happen, I would suspect. Yeah. You know, I would think that there's, you have no sign. It just, boom, you're down. Yeah. You get the slightest, I called them brain quakes. I don't know if there's an official term, but, um, it would feel like an earthquake was going off in my brain, like it was literally vibrating like crazy. And then that's it. That's the only warning you get. So maybe a second. It's, it wasn't even enough to, to sit down. Oh, wow. That had to be scary. Mm -hmm. But fortunately, this will sound very odd. Fortunately, I was so messed up by all the concussions that I didn't even know that I should be scared of what was happening to me. Wow. So for how many years were you, were you passing out? Was it years, months? It was months. It was about four months. Um, and then they finally figured out what was causing this. So I went for um, a surgery. I was actually in the hospital and they didn't even put me in ICU. Like they knew this was happening to me. They didn't put me on bed rest or 
or anything like that. So it's just a, a, looking back, it's a very surreal experience. And um, I think it was, I found out on the Tuesday and they scheduled me for surgery on a Thursday. And in the interim, I had three or four more of these episodes where, you know, I just cracked my head. You know, in the hospital rooms, they have these bureau credenza um, filing cabinet things beside your bed, dressers that are, yeah. you know, made of metal with hard edges and stuff like that. So I bounced off one of those pretty good as well. Jeez. So. So what caused your weight gain? Do you have any idea? Uh, I guess part genetics, part um, just having not a good gut biome, which is the cause of a lot of obesity. Um, so I, and of course I wasn't eating very well when I was young. So I think that's the majority of it. Um, my body was just totally out of whack for, you know, however many reasons there were. Um, I was just predisposed to gaining weight. Gotcha. As some of us are, but then again, you know, it has to do with the, the diet and the, the food that we're eating, you know, especially like before I started eating organic, I noticed that I was, I was gaining weight. Mm -hmm. And I also noticed that I was hungry more than I was. And once we switched to organic, that that weight just came right off it was not a big deal at all yeah so those ultra processed foods and ultra processed oils are are just toxic to the body well they are and that part of the problem was especially with the genetically modified organisms and that the foods contain the thing is is our body doesn't recognize the dna so it stores mm -hmm. it in our fat cells Mm -hmm. So, you know, and I think some of us, cause I look around and I'm like, well, I see what this person's eating and they're not overweight. So obviously some of us, it impacts worse than other people or do they have some underlying issue? They obviously have some superpower. <laughs> uh, I don't think so. I, I think there's, I think there's something else that's, that's going on. I think that, you know, maybe our DNA has, has something to do with it. And I don't like to say that a lot because they throw that around so much. They don't, oh, what's your DNA? It's your DNA. And no, mm -hmm. it's not my DNA. It's, you know, but I don't know. It's, it's, it's something. Yeah. It's something. At some point you have to take personal responsibility for what you're putting in your own body. Right. And it took me a long time to uh, to get to that point. So you were on insulin? Yes. When when this all started and the first time I went to emergency, they, um, they do your blood work because they thought I was having a heart attack. And in that blood test, they found out that I was pretty heavily type 2 diabetic. diabetic. Um, in Canadian numbers, I was a 23. In American numbers... My blood sugar was about a 420. Um, wow. So basically I had molasses pumping through my veins. Jeez. And that's the thing too. My first husband was a type two diabetic and he died from complications. Mm -hmm. um, but see that the, at the same time, he wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing. He really, mm -hmm. you know, he was eating foods that he knew turned into sugar in his body and he ate them anyway not caring so it, it's really hard because with type 2 diabetes for a lot of the time you don't even feel that anything's wrong with your body until something goes severely wrong like some type of neuropathy or you know a kidney start it's failing or, or something like that so it's, it's it's very invisible and hard to conceptualize for most people and I know I had no idea I was type two diabetic, um, just didn't. Um, but I also know having gone through this ridiculous medical journey for, you know, I guess 13 years now, sometimes you just get tired of going to the doctor. Right. You know, right. It, it can grind you down. Especially when they're not giving you any answers. Mm -hmm. When yeah. there's answers to be had uh, and the mainstream medical people just aren't 
you know, up on it. Right. I'll, I'll say, I don't say this to bash the medical profession um, because in any industry, you know, you're going to have your superstars and, you know, you're not so great performers. Um, at the beginning of this journey, I happened to just run into a bunch of not so great performers. Uh, now I've got a great medical team. No, good. I'm happy to hear that. But that was like what my husband, when you mentioned the neuropathy, you know, that was part of his problem. But he was having pain from his scrotum to his rectum and they couldn't mm -hmm. figure out what was going on at this time. He wasn't he was no longer working because he mm -hmm. couldn't. He was in such, in such pain. Mm -hmm. And he went to the one doctor and they had said that he had um, an infection in his prostate and put him on antibiotics. Well, he was on antibiotics for like for two freaking months. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you need to go get a second opinion. I said, because something else is wrong. And he's like, well, what are you, a doctor? And I'm like, no, but it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that there's something else wrong. Mm -hmm. So finally he went to this other doctor and he didn't know it was wrong right after, well, at, right, right away. So then he consulted with his 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 team and it, they determined that his bowels were back were backing up. They were moving backward and instead of things flushing mm -hmm. out, it, it was backing up. So, but anyway, yeah. So, you know, and then he knew about diabetes because his cousin was a diabetic. Mm -hmm. So he knew the symptoms. And he had had the symptoms, so he he knew. But anyway, we're getting off topic here. This is not about my husband. This is about you. Yeah. Well, you know, we get off topic sometimes. <laughs> yep. Okay. So you also you were experiencing asthma. Yeah. Um, so maybe I should step back a little bit to the uh, what was causing me to pass out and the heart and everything like that. Okay. So the solution to that is a pacemaker. Um, so a pacemaker is, you know, maybe about the size of a pocket watch or something like that. It's a little supercomputer with a couple of electrical wires. They thread through your veins and it replaces the heartbeat that you no longer have. Right. So that was the solution to, to keep me alive. And um, so they kept me alive for a while. I, it was, you know, I suspect something went wrong in the surgery because I was really beat up going into the surgery and I was even worse coming out of the surgery. So um, I, I don't know because I was asleep and nobody right. said anything to me, but um, the nurses were amazed I was alive. So uh, that's uh, that was the message I got as I was leaving the hospital. So. How many years ago was this? This was 2009, summer of 2009. So August, I believe. I, sh I should be better with these dates. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you didn't question why you were more beat up after surgery than, than when you went in? You know what? I was, I was just so beat up. I wasn't questioning <laughs> anything. You know, I was happy they found some sort of solution. And that right. I was walking out of the hospital and this wasn't going to happen to me anymore. But my brain was really scrambled from all the concussions. It, uh, I had lost memory. I had lost some speech function. I had lost depth perception, fine motor controls, balance, like just a whole whack of things from all the concussions that had to heal. And nobody checked me for any neurological damage. Nobody. So how many concussions would you say you had? Um, all told, 30-ish. Wow, within that three, four months period of time? Oh, in that period of time, 15 to 20 that we know of. Wow. And then in subsequent episodes where the pacemaker failed, which is another interesting story. Oh my um, gosh. I went through the whole process again and had more concussions and oxygen deprivation and all sorts of things so you were just a hot mess yeah yeah oh that 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 really sucks 
<laughs> so you said that there were times when the pacemaker failed. How many times it has, has it failed? Um, that's a good question. Nobody's ever asked me that. Uh, enough that I've had three replacements. Wow. And I'm going for another one in the new year because one of the batteries is going to run out. So. So what's the the lifespan of the pacemaker? How long is it supposed to last? Normally, depending on what um, conditions it's trying to correct and how much electricity it has to use or drain the battery, you can get seven, 10, 12 years. I didn't make it to four years. Wow. So, because what happened is I started passing out again and hitting my head and went to the hospital a couple of times and they couldn't figure things out. And then uh, a doctor that wasn't on my team figured out uh, that something was wrong with the pacemaker and they narrowed it down to one of the leads, the wires had cracked. So these leads are, are just like an extension cord. You know, they're a wire that takes electrical current, but they have to be insulated just like, you know, any electrical cord you have in your home. Right. And the insulation cracked and it, it was shorting things out and they didn't know why it cracked. Um, I suspect from something I learned a couple of years later that it was because something went wrong in that first surgery. So um, that first attempted surgery to replace it didn't go well. I'll skip a lot of the details. You can read it in my book. And um, then I was bedridden for, I think, seven days after that surgery didn't go well. And that next surgery didn't go well. Um, Jeez. But they, they finally got the pacemaker in and I was up and running again, but uh, pretty, again, pretty battered up. And it doesn't end there. Um, and then it happened again in 2018. So, and that surgery was, was no joy. The, uh, the plan in that surgery was to put in an entirely new pacemaker and entirely new leads on the right side of my heart. Um, Cause the original ones on the left side of my heart. And then when they install that, they would turn off the old one and just, you know, good riddance. Um, but when they tried to insert the, the leads in the new one, they couldn't get both leads installed. So I'm on the table with like a malfunctioning pacemaker and half a new pacemaker. And, you know, thank God I had an amazing surgeon and uh, he figured out a way to sort of synchronize them. So when the original pacemaker would fail, the new one would kick in. And it's a great system. At the time I was told I was one of eight people in the world who had uh, simultaneous pacemakers. I don't know if that's true or not, or if it's kind of like hospital urban myth, but right. um, it's also not an exact science. So it takes a number of adjustments to make sure that the timing is right and the sensors are right. So I had a few micro um, collapses in the interim, but I, I haven't had any for over a year now. Well, that's good. I know uh, my husband's sister, she has a pacemaker mm -hmm. and I have not heard her talk anything about this. Yeah. <laughs> like what you're experiencing. So I'm wondering how common it is for people to have an issue with the pacemaker? Uh, it's not so common. Um, you know, they install about 800,000 of these a year. So it's a pretty common procedure. Right. And my understanding is if, you know, things go to plan, it's probably like a 25 minute procedure. Oh, and wow. Uh, my last couple of surgeries were in the four to five hour range, if I remember correctly. Jeez, why? Because they were trying to figure out how to fix something that they weren't expecting. So what I learned eventually is um, one of the vein that they had threaded the, the pacemaker lead through had collapsed, like just 
And that wouldn't have happened from um, the second or third surgery. It would have happened, something would have happened before that to cause the vein to collapse. And usually that's some sort of trauma of something happening to the vein. And that's why I suspect something happened in that first surgery that uh, I wasn't told about. So where they damaged the vein going in. Mm -hmm. That's not cool. <laughs> <laughs> no, that not is, cool at all. That is so not cool. Mm -hmm. So um, you say that you died like yeah. 20 times. Was, was that due to this incident, the pacemaker? Well, even before, before the pacemaker. You had the pacemaker or before, before you had the pacemaker? Before and after when it failed. But um, I'm using the definition of died uh, as clinically dead that my cardiologist gave me. And that's if your heart stops beating for 30 seconds and you don't breathe for 30 seconds, you're clinically dead. So we know because I was in the hospital and being recorded on the remote monitors, I've had incidences from three to five minutes before my heart would kick in again. So that's like right on the borderline of, you know, your brains, my brain was damaged, but really, really damaged. Five minutes without oxygen is, is about the limit you can go. Right. But you, you know, you, you were saying earlier that you had problem with your speech and cognitivity, but that seems like that's all, is that all back? I mean, your speech is fine. I'd say I'm 90 odd percent back. Um, I had to do a lot of learning. I had to, you know, relearn so many things. Um, and the majority didn't really start coming back until I started intermittent fasting. So, cause it, and if people aren't familiar with intermittent fasting, um, most people think it's some sort of wacko new diet. It's not a diet. Um, no, it's not. It's a, way of eat, it's a way of eating. Yes. And they prioritize the weight loss part of it over the healing benefits of it. And I have to tell you, uh, having been a moderator in a Facebook group with 335 members um, and coaching people on intermittent fasting, uh, probably 95 to 98% of these were women, um, I can attest to the healing powers, not only for myself, but for the thousands of people that I've talked to. Now, the intermediate fasting it's it's kind of like it doesn't it doesn't seem textbook to me because there are variations of it. Am I correct? Yes, everybody responds to a different pattern of fasting. Some people can get away with shorter fasts. Some people need longer fasts. Some people need to switch it up more often. A big factor seems to be how badly abused your body was before you started fasting and how much your body has to heal. So a lot of the women as a big generalization, because I'm obviously not a woman or I hope it's obvious. Um, it is. <laughs> it's obvious. You know, they talked about their dieting history and, you know, having yo-yoed and yo-yoed and yo-yoed. And the more you yo-yo, the more it screws up your gut biome. And then the gut biome, um, if I remember correctly from Dr. Iran Elianov, I think is his name. He's an Israeli researcher. He specializes in the gut biome. He says they have memories. The gut biome essentially run your entire body. And if you lose weight and this particular tribe of, of bacteria in your gut aren't happy, they'll make you gain back more than you lost. And it's that cycle and cycle and that throws off all your hormones and everything else. And it's just uh, a mess. Right. They had, they, they did a test with two twins. One, one twin was of normal weight and the other twin had some extra weight on her. 
um, they tested the gut microbiome and they found that the one that was of average weight, they described her gut micro, microbiome like a rainforest, very, just very diverse bacteria. Mm-hmm. Where the twin that had extra weight on her, her gut microbiome was not so, wasn't flourishing the same way. Mm-hmm. So that's very interesting that you bring, bring that up. Yeah. Uh, if the, you go ahead. If you um, look up Dr. Tim Spector, who's um, one of the co-founders of the Zoe Project in England, he's also one of the world's foremost experts on gut biome research, and he did a lot of research on twins and triplets and things of that nature. Um, yeah, it's it's very evident that you have to have a, a good diversity, and you also have to not feed your gut biome things that make the bad bacteria flourish and dampen the good bacteria. Right, right. And this is something too that in the health industry and the medical industry that is not talked about, like they're not testing your gut microbiome. So we don't know which strands of probiotics we need to take to help our gut microbiome because it's not tested and everybody's different. Your gut microbiome is different from mine. It's like a fingerprint, Mm -hmm. you know, it's it's very different. So, but what we do is we'll take one probiotic and look at the strands in that. And then we might take another one that has different strands, but we also drink kombucha. I brew kombucha. Mm -hmm. So like kombucha contains both both the probiotics and the prebiotics, which the probiotics feed off of. Mm-hmm. So you know, yeah, it's not only that, but that's eighty percent of our immune system is located in the gut. Mm-hmm. You know, so if our gut microbiome isn't healthy, we're opening ourselves up to a variety of health issues, not just weight gain. Mm-hmm. If your if your gut micro, microbiome gets too heavily weighted to the bad bacteria side, the bad bacteria start to eat through that very thin lining you have in your large intestine and they get into your bloodstream and they wreak havoc all over your body. They just kill your immune system and your immune system overreacts. And that's why you have all these difficulties with so many things. Um, You know, it can be anything from rheumatoid arthritis to eczema. Um, and we've seen people reverse those things almost entirely once they've been intermittent fasting for a while. I mean, I reversed my type two diabetes. I had, um, diabetic retinopathy in my, in my eye. And I went to see the surgeon and he did me a checkup and he's like, it's gone. It's totally gone. Nice. So uh, it reversed my asthma, it reversed my sleep apnea. As you mentioned in my intro, the, my body used to just ache. I mean, ache so bad it was hard to get out of bed in the morning. And I thought that was just from all the abuse I had put my body through. And it turns out it was just inflammation because probably f- within four or five months of starting fasting, it was all gone. And here we are you know, four years later, I don't have an ache or pain in my body. I I don't get headaches. I don't get migraines. Um, If I get a cold, it's like a day of sniffles, Um, you know, except for COVID, uh, which everybody got. Um, I didn't. I didn't. Oh, you're you're very fortunate. I didn't Um, get it. I was just, I was, you know, I eat organic. I eat clean. mm -hmm. I, I was taking drinking the kombucha daily. I make elderberry elixir. I was taking the elderberry elixir. I was taking zinc, vitamin C, vitamin D. And what else? There was one other thing. We were just, we were really just like bombarding our bodies with good stuff. So, and I was even exposed to it because my daughter had it. Mm -hmm. And I was with her when she first got her symptoms and I didn't get it. She lived with my son. My son didn't get it that she was carpooling with uh, one of her coworkers. Nobody in the office that she worked in got it. 
That's remarkable. I have to admit, I wouldn't know an elderberry if it hit me in the face. Elderberry is a flavonoid, so anything that okay. has a real deep color, anything that has a real deep color to it is considered a flavonoid. Even mm -hmm. coffee and dark chocolate are flavonoids, so they're natural. chocolate. I've seen. So there are natural antioxidants, mm -hmm. and elderberry also supports the immune system. Okay. Just, just like the the kombucha does. So, yeah, we were just really bombarding our immune system. My husband thinks he had a mild case of it. We had gone to Arizona in 2020, mm -hmm. and he, when he came back, he said he wasn't feeling too good, and he thinks that he might have had one. You know what? Well, we shouldn't have mentioned that because I had another person on, and we mentioned it. Just because we mentioned that thing, they ended up taking down my video. Okay. So none of this has happened, and... Uh... I'll, I'll give a medical disclaimer on intermittent fasting as well. Um, generally, uh, it's not recommended for women who are pregnant or breastfeeding or for people who have had um, an eating disorder of any type. So check with your appropriate medical people before you start taking intermittent, start doing intermittent fasting. Um, you may have to adjust medications. I know I did. Um, as I went through the process in the first four or six months, I would have to go to the diabetes clinic every couple of weeks or every month and get my glucometer adjusted to get my insulin doses adjusted and reduced. So, and there's lots of medications that could be affected. So please don't do this on your own and don't adjust your medications on your own. Can, can I ask you a personal question? Sure. You know, after you were saying like that, you don't, you're not, you don't deal with this issue and you don't deal with that issue. And this is very mild. Can you share with the listening audience how old you are? I'm 61. I know I look like I'm 37, but I am 61. Yeah, I'm actually going to be 58 at the end of this month. Uh, I beat you. <laughs> Yeah, but, you know, it's it just like it goes to show you that when you change your eating habits, you know, and you start giving your body the good stuff that it needs. I've never been on meds, I've never had mm -hmm. any medications as far as like being a diabetic or anything like that. I haven't even been to a, a doctor in over 12 years because I've, wow. no I've had no need for it. Mm -hmm. You know, they keep wanting to sell me health insurance. I said, for what? You know, I don't go. You know, I mean, thank God that I haven't had any anything come up that I really needed to go. Like my mm -hmm. husband recently in the last few months had to have his gallbladder out. And Oops. then, yeah, and then he fell off the ladder and he broke his collarbone. So, you know, for stuff like that, you know, doctors come in handy, but, you know, do, do I really want to get an insurance? You know, for so since he had to have his gallbladder out, I've been like researching and going, okay, how can I keep my gallbladder? <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, I don't want the because he we share the same diet, we eat the same way, we take the same supplements. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's like, you know, how did this happen? Why did it happen? But I suspect a lot of it happened before he changed his diet. And to be honest, that's why I'm on a lot of the medications that I'm on is as uh, prophylactic for the damage that might have been done before I got myself under control. So damage to my kidneys, damage to my heart, uh, that sort of thing. Um, so th th I'm taking them as preventative more than I need to take them, if that makes any sense. Have you looked into like herbs, like CoQ10 is, is good for the heart? Mm-hmm. I'm not sure about the kidneys, but I know, you know, there, we're experiencing a lot of uh, fatty liver now in our society mm -hmm. because our liver is so overloaded. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I take Hawthorne berry to support my liver, you know, so that it, it can work and function the way that it, it's supposed to. Those I've and, heard of because my friend Jen grows them on her property. <laughs> and dandelion root too is really good for the liver. Mm -hmm. So intermittent fasting, one of the one of the first things to get repaired, I guess, 
for lack of a better term, is fatty liver. That's when you start in the process and it starts to normalize your hormones and your in basal insulin and things like that, and you start to lose fat from your body, that's the first place that it comes off is the liver fat. And it doesn't take much to get a fatty liver. Like you can have two or three pounds of liver or fat around your liver. And, you know, that's almost a death sentence. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an issue these days. But it's not just the food. It's also all the toxins that we're bombarded by. You mm -hmm. know, the, the cleaning products in our house, the, the beauty care products, the personal hygiene products. You know, it, the formaldehyde, it's in our furniture and carpets, and we're just bombarded by so many toxins that mm -hmm. our liver is going, what the hell? <laughs> what are you doing to me? It's mm -hmm. like, I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> you know, this ain't what it's about. So tell the listening audience exactly what is intermediate fasting. So it's a pattern of eating that you can adapt where you alternate not eating for a certain amount of time um, with eating. So when I started in 2018, because I was on all these medications and had this crazy medical background, I started a 12-12 system, which means I would fast for 12 hours. So no food, no artificial sweeteners, no diet drinks, no bone broth, just water. And after 12 hours, I could eat. And it doesn't mean you get to eat for 12 hours straight. That means in that 12 hour period, you can, you know, have your meal or two meals or three meals, whatever you can pack in. And that started in May. By September, I was doing a 23-1. So that was fasting 23 hours and having one hour to eat my meal. And they call that OMAD, one meal a day. And as you said before, there's dozens of different protocols that people can adopt. So right now I'm on 24, that's my schedule. I fast for 20, I have a four hour eating window. I'm trying to get back to where I'm doing some alternate day fasting where I would start Sunday night or Sunday evening fast for 40, 42 hours, and then eat a couple of good meals and then go back to my regular 24. So I hope that's not too much information for people. Could you give us some other examples? Cause I've hear, I've heard of people like, you know, well, you can like do a 10 hour fast and then a, you know, 14 hours where you go ahead and eat. I mean, you can mix it up like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that's, ba that's basically the way my husband, husband and I eat and we have been eating before we even knew this was a thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it was just, it was just the way we eat. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a reason, you know, people have been fasting for thousands of years. I mean, that's right. what our ancestors did when there was no no such thing as organized farming. I mean, you would fast for two, three, four days and you'd have to go out and find, you know, a dinosaur to eat or whatever. Um, so uh, the book I started off with um, is the, the Obesity Code by Dr. Jason Fung. So he's a nephrologist here in Toronto and he got very tired of seeing his patients had to have limbs amputated and losing their kidneys and stuff like that. And he did a lot of research and he started putting people on various intermittent fasting protocols. And uh, he's reversed type two diabetes in literally thousands of people. So it is possible despite what your traditional doctors say, many people right. can reverse their condition. The Facebook group I was in was run by a lady named Jen Stevens. You can find her at jenstevens.com. And this book is a New York Times bestseller. And what makes this book so good, and it's my Bible, is it tells you how to tweak between the different protocols. Because Jen has counseled over 500,000 people through her various groups. So she has an amazing amount of experience helping people with the technical aspects of fasting. So um, 
what works for me won't work for you necessarily. Right. And it might take a while to figure out which system is best for you. And after a while, your body might enter some form of homeostasis and you might plateau and you might say, okay, I have to switch things up. So that's a big part of it is, you know, understanding that the fasting isn't going to change your, your bodily functions work, but you know, what you change in your body might, might change things up. You might start eating something new that messes up your gut biome, or you might be under some sort of stress or anything like that that can throw off your hormones. So there's a lot of factors that go into, you know, keeping your body under control. But because we've been eating so many ultra processed foods, we don't get to listen or hear our body's signals really clearly anymore. So one of a pair of the hormones that that get really impacted when we're eating a lot of ultra processed food, or we've become type two diabetic or metabolically compromised is your leptin and ghrelin, your hunger and satiety hormones. And most people have no idea what it's like to actually be hungry. They hear their stomach growl. They think that means that they're hungry, so they should eat. And that's not what it is at all. No so, suggestion. Yeah. One of the, the most amazing things that I experienced through fasting is appetite correction. I think that's a term from Dr. Bert Herring is your body will actually signal you and tell you you've eaten enough. And there's a variety of different signals for people. Um, but for me, I get a little cough. It's a little, <coughs> oh. and that's my shutoff valve. That's like, you've eaten enough. Stop it. Move on. Well, I think, you know, you brought up uh, the, the fact of listening to your body, which I think is very important, you know, and it's, it's not just it's how food re, reacts on your body, how it makes you feel physically mm -hmm. and, you know, what it does to you. So we have to listen to that and adapt to that. I know it, before gluten-free was a thing, <clears throat> I went gluten-free at 17. Wow. So that was back in the what, 80s, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, 90s, no, 80s. Yeah, I was doing for me because I realized that when I ate bread, when I ate anything that was flour based, it, it was, it was like paper mache around my lower abs. That's mm -hmm. what, I've heard that's, that. That's what it was doing. So it, when I cut that stuff out, I didn't have their problem anymore. Mm hmm. So, I mean, right now we're living in a great time because we got cauliflower crust pizza. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've got uh, Ezekiel bread. I don't know if you have it there in Canada. Ezekiel bread. Ezekiel bread. No, I've never. Oh, Ezekiel bread. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So now I can have sandwiches again. Because <laughs> <laughs> for years I wouldn't eat a sandwich. If I wanted a sandwich, I would take the meat and the cheese and fold it up, put some mayonnaise on there, and that was my sandwich. Mm -hmm. I just refused to eat bread. The other thing um, that oh, I should have wrote it down, there was something else that you had touched on. Well, uh, listening to your body. Mm -hmm. Hormones? No, it wasn't the hormones. It was something else. That's why I got the pen and paper. I should have wrote it down and I didn't because I thought I would remember. But I'm human and I forgot. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll throw in a phrase from, from Dr. Fung. And he said, people always blame their diet failures on a lack of willpower. And he says, your hormones will beat willpower 24-7 365 days a year. If your hormones are out of whack and you don't do anything to address that, getting your basal insulin levels down and things of that nature, getting rid of the toxic oils, um, it's a recipe for disaster. Your body has to be able to work at a certain level to help you out. So do you eat organic? 
No, I don't. Um, no, I shouldn't say it. I eat some organic, but um, I eat better than I did five years ago. I don't eat perfect. Um, my friend Jen Stevens has a book called Cleanish and talks about many of the things you've talked about and all the toxins in the environment and things like that. So I'm never going to have the discipline, or I don't think I will, to be 100% clean like some people can be, but I eat cleanish. I certainly eat so much less ultra processed food than I did a few years ago. So why do you think that you can't go 100% organic? Just because I know myself and I know the challenges that I've had. And uh, food in Canada is a lot more expensive than it is in the United States. Is it? It's You really, really, really pay a premium. Excuse me. And we're already paying a premium uh, because of the pandemic. So we're paying a premium on a premium on a premium right now. Right. That being said, I did have some organic corn on the cob that we picked up on the weekend that was amazing. Just nice. amazing. I haven't had any corn on the cob because I haven't found any that's organic. So I haven't eaten corn on the cob like in years. But, but that sounds so good. I mm -hmm. remember when I was younger, we used to go to Wisconsin, which is known for growing corn. And I had an uncle that lived there and he would just grill corn. He would leave it, in it, leave it in his bathtub overnight and soak it in sugar. And then, oh, wow. yeah, and then we would go and it was just like grilling corn all day long. You know, we ate was corn. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but, it was clean. Yeah, back then. Yeah, because I was a kid. They weren't doing all this mess. I mean, they didn't start messing with our food. Well, they started after World War II, mm -hmm. but they really cranked it up like in 1996. Mm -hmm. is when they really cranked it up and you know I guess I can see your point in you know at least staying away from the processed food because I know you're not getting the well I don't know about there but here in the United States there, there's a lot of canola oil a lot mm -hmm. of cottonseed oil and soy and products and then the sugar now the sugar they here anyway they use beet sugar Mm -hmm. which is highly genetically modified. All four of the ingredients that I just mentioned are highly genetically modified. Mm -hmm. So it, unless you're eating organic, you're eating junk. You're eating stuff from the laboratory. It's not real food. Yeah, the only thing, the only oils we use now are olive oil and avocado oil. And if you want to think about cottonseed oil, which is so highly processed, if you wear a cotton shirt, does it feel oily to you? Mm -mm. No, because there's nothing in it. So how they make oil out of that is, is just tons of chemical washing. And your body doesn't like that stuff. Well, that's just like with the high, high fructose corn syrup. Mm -hmm. That's something else that, you know, they pushed it. I don't know about there, but here in the U.S., they pushed it. They would have commercials on TV sta stating that, sugar was sugar and that there's the high fructose corn syrup was no different than, than other sugar mm -hmm. but that's not true i mean once again our bodies don't recognize the dna so it's like you no know, but now they're trying to get sneaky and they're just putting corn syrup so even if i see corn syrup on something we eat very little processed food but mm -hmm. when we do it and actually it's more when I look at stuff, if I if I get a sweet tooth and I, I want some chocolate, you know, I'm looking to see is there high fructose corn syrup? No, nope, but there's corn syrup. So mm -hmm. to me, that's the same thing. You're just trying to make Hide me it. go, oh, well, this don't happen in it. You know, it's fine. I can go ahead. Mm -hmm. So talk about your books. Um, well, my first book is sitting with the publisher. So we're doing all the preliminary work on it. It's called The Summer I Died 20 Times because that's what happened to me. And it's just about this whole medical adventure um, and all the pacemaker failures and a lot of cognitive medical bias and medical error that happened in my journey um, and how I've come back from it because there was certainly no recovery plan given to me for all my head trauma 
as I mentioned before, nobody even checked me for it. So everything I've done, uh, I've pretty much done on my own. And uh, as, as my therapist said to me, um, it's amazing. I'm any degree of functional at this point. I, mean, I tell doctors my story. They don't believe it. They have to read my file. Well, you know, I believe everything happens for a reason. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, I don't believe in coincidences. I don't believe in luck. You know, what happened to you happened so that you could share your story and share your journey so that if that somebody else is in that situation, they've got a guide that says, oh, he experienced the same thing. This is what he did. Mm -hmm. And then they, they can copy what you did so they too can heal. Mm -hmm. Attitude is such a huge part of all of this. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to gloss over it and make it seem like it was easy for me. It certainly wasn't. And it's certainly hard to have a positive attitude when, and I'm, you know, uh, I believe in God and it's, you know, very hard to have strong belief in God when all this bad stuff keeps happening to you. But on the flip side, how bad can it be? Because I'm still alive. So, you know, God doesn't make mistakes. So outside of God, is there anything else that helped you to stay positive through the, this whole ordeal? Um, getting back to exercise. So exercise always boosts your endorphins. Um, and that's another thing that gets blocked uh, when we eat poorly. We don't get the full blast of endorphins uh, and that the happy, happy that we should. Um, and I started very intense learning. So anything you can do that challenges your brain outside what it was normally used to. So learning a new instrument, learning a new language, learning um, anything complicated, complicated subjects, they help your brain to rewire and intermittent fasting does that as well. It creates these neurotropic factors or BDNA, blood-derived uh, neurotropic. Um, I can't remember the last part. So still some brain injury. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, it gets rid of the scar tissue. It gets, you know, starts rewiring your brain. So the more complex stuff you can learn, the better you are. Even if you can't take a test on it in a week, because, you know, it'll go on. Just the fact that you exercised your brain to that degree for that period of time will work wonders for you. I had heard about this man. Well, actually, he was given his testimony. He was basically given a death sentence. He, uh, his liver, his heart, and his brain so I forget where he was living, but he left and he went off and he studied with some indigenous people and mm -hmm. he regenerated all three of those organs. So, you know, they say that those organs can't be regenerated. Well, obviously they can because he did it. Mm -hmm. So just like what you're talking about with the brain, mm -hmm. you know, by, by doing this, do you think that... Um, People with like Alzheimer and dementia would benefit oh, from that? For sure. For sure they do. How much? I, I can't say. Um, but one of the things that people can do, um, I learned from Dr. Rhonda Patrick, who's a researcher, uh, one of these PhD super brainiac people. Um, she's really into saunas. And it doesn't really matter if it's the infrared or the wet or the dry saunas. People that do regular sauna use, I think four times a week, four or five times a week, show a 60% reduction in morbidity risks. And that's across the board, cardiovascular, um, your inflammation diseases like MS or things like that, uh, arthritis, dementia, Alzheimer's, the... Um, you just give yourself an extra layer of protection. And if you combine that with some regular exercise and eating better, I mean, you're way ahead of the game. Right. 
Well, we're at the top of the hour. Is there anything you want to leave the listening audience with? Um, if you want to get a hold of me, you can find me on Instagram. I'm repeatedly dead Fred. Oh, and uh, or my Gmail is repeatedly dot dead dot Fred at Gmail. And if you have any questions about intermittent fasting or anything, please reach out. Do you have a website? Not yet. So. Not yet. Okay. And are you on Facebook? Uh, not so much. More on uh, the Instagram and stuff. It's um, Facebook has become almost like these processed oils to me. It's a little too toxic. <laughs> well, yeah, I'll I'll agree, but. Well, thank you, Fred, so much for being on and for sharing your story. I greatly appreciate it. My pleasure. I'm thrilled to be able to share and hopefully inspire some people. Right. And to the listening audience, don't forget to like, share, and hit the bell, subscribe. And until next time, just keep shining your light. Smash that thumbs.